All right. Happy Friday, everyone. And we are back again with another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we're exploring the landscape of learning technology, cutting through the fluff and demystifying all that good stuff so we can help you go digital right, the right way. And so today I'm joined by Sam Herring, and we're talking about all things collaborative online learning. He's from Intrepid, and we're going to see how Intrepid's making that happen. So for those of you uh, who are joining us live, Go ahead, give us a thumbs up, share the post, tag in somebody who'd benefit from the conversation. And while you're at it, comment in and let us know where you're joining from. So I'm streaming from Waukesha, Wisconsin, which for those of you who don't know, which I wouldn't blame you uh, because it's a, not a town that probably pops up in your list of places, but it's a suburb of Milwaukee. So I'm in Wisconsin. Sam, how about you? Where, where are you joining from? I am streaming in from Seattle, Washington today. All right. How's the weather up there today? You know, it's uh, it's beautiful. It's sunny. Um, it is. Uh, it's looking. It's looking just great outside. Sunny and you know, looks like it's gonna be mid sixties today. Nice day. Okay. So you got you have nice weather. It's we've had this weird heat bubble that has just crushed us. It's mm. it's been in like the nineties. The humidity's been been just the worst. Um, so, you know, and, and add to the fact that our air conditioner went out (laughs) two days ago. So of course, right, right at the time when it's the absolute hottest, it goes out. Now we got it fixed yesterday. So thankfully everybody's a little less crabby. Um, nobody's sweating anymore. It's, it's actually not too bad. So perfect. Well, all right, before we get into the conversation of, you know, online collaborative learning, we've got the unrelated question that we always have. All right. And for those of you who are watching, you can you can contribute to comment in and ask this. But I'm curious for me, Sam, what household chore do you actually enjoy? You know, this was a this was an this is a, this is an easy one for me, actually. That's what you said. You said this is going to be easy. You didn't even have to think. Yeah, this could be easy. And there's actually I give, I give two answers to this. I give the household chore I, I like today and the household chore that I, I did as a child, but I'll, I'll answer the question, which is I actually really enjoy doing the dishes. Enjoy um, doing the dish, like hand washing, not just like rinsing and putting in the dishwasher. Well, you know, the combination, right? You got to oh, your pocket. combination. I enjoy cleaning up after dinner. I'm a little OCD and uh, my wife reminds me of this, right? So I like to make sure the, ki- the kitchen is all clean, but actually I think I like it too, because I like, it's that moment when I can just sort of have a little me time, just kind of like right. think you know kind of put some music okay on. so this isn't a collaborative project then no, when you're, when you're, okay, this is sam <laughs> this is sam stays in and sam takes care of the kitchen yeah it's it's a self-directed experience it's more of an asynchronous <laughs> it's, a, it's an asynchronous <laughs> chore experience that we're talking about here okay everybody leave <laughs> right now i get it that but uh you know yeah okay okay all right i was gonna say because when it comes to washing the dishes for me it brings up memories back when i was when i was a kid um, we didn't have a dishwasher okay. and my brother and I, he was 10 years younger than me, but we, we were always tasked with, we had to do the dishes. Mom made dinner, dad like grilled or whatever. And we had to do the dishes and we would like fight. We'd throw water at each other, <laughs> but we had fun with it. So I, I would agree that as a kid, I don't know that I thought of it as a favorite household chore, but I yeah. can see that. All right. And then, uh, so for me, this one, I, I actually had to think about this a little bit because I actually like cleaning up the kitchen too. I like folding laundry, but if I had to pick a favorite, I would say vacuuming. vacuuming. I love to vacuum. I have no idea why for me, similar to you, I think it's right. I, I get in my head space you know, I'm sitting there just vacuuming. I like the look of the, the carpet after you vacuum. There's something yeah. very clean about vacuuming the house. So some people have added they love laundry. It, Jack Jack Sylvester, he's he's yeah. in your camp. Oh, he's in your camp filling the dishwasher. So okay. dishes is uh, definitely something that is a common theme here. So, all right. Well, lots of household chores. Either way, either way, Anthony says, Maybe you can come to his house. Right. <laughs> so you can come clean up the kitchen. Seattle area. There you go. If, I'll, if, ask God, I'll be there, right? <laughs> exactly. If the learning tech thing doesn't work out, you know, there's always the backup. You can come take care of take care of things at people's houses. Awesome. That's, that's well, and the other thing, unrelated to, to learning tech, though, you did share with me before we came live. You have you have big plans for this weekend, right? So what, what is that? Yeah, yeah. So I was Christopher and I were, were chatting early, and um, uh, so I grew up in a household with dogs. Um, it was 
you, you've heard of like the crazy cat family. Like we were the crazy dog family. Okay. And we we raised my family raised and showed Irish wolfhounds, but we had probably I don't know ten or twelve different breeds over over the over my childhood. So I think we it's not an exaggeration uh, to say that we had uh, at the four, same time though ten or twelve uh, breeds, maybe maybe four or five. You okay. know. Okay. It, we would have in my childhood, we easily had over 50 dogs um, over the course of my childhood, you know? So, uh, so as a child of my chore, I don't have to say it's my favorite chore, but I was getting up every day um, cleaning kennels. Um, so maybe that gave me a little, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, spit polish and grit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, what we're doing today, tomorrow actually is we, in, in my family, we don't have a dog now. And my kids remind me that like every day. And so, you know, <laughs> Especially now that they're home all the time to remind yeah. you every day. The coronavirus has changed everything and uh, we're, we're now, uh, we're getting the puppy tomorrow. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And how old are the kids? The kids are uh, 12 and eight. So a sixth okay. grader, Monica, and a second grader, Malcolm. And so getting an interesting view into, like all of us, into digital learning um, it, it, uh, through, through the lens of, uh, of yeah. the world. Yeah. Okay. Well, at that age, I'm sure they're very ecstatic to be to be getting a dog. They know, right? This isn't going to be like a surprise. We're here. We're picking up a dog. No. Okay. No. All right. So you're going to hear about it until you <laughs> until you're driving home. Yeah, we've got we got the hourly countdown, the countdown clock going right now. So it's, okay. it's yeah. All right. All right. Well, very exciting. Uh, that would be a fun way to spend the weekend. I'm sure, even though it will be no shortage of of busyness because you know kids love to get dogs. And then it's like, you have to take care of it. And it's like, oh, well, yeah. dad, can you do that? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, We've had those conversations. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. TBD. All right. Well, so let's, let's jump into this because we're talking about uh, collaborative online learning, right? Whatever we want to do. But before we get into that, you're, we're talking about Intrepid. And one of the big things that I always like to do with this is just really help define for people who may not know what Intrepid is, yeah. where, what is it and where does it play in the space of digital learning? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we're, Intrepid is, a, is a, what we call a collaborative learning platform. And what that means is uh, we're, we're a platform that um, brings together learners, uh, often in a cohort, um, that yeah. travel through a common learning experience together over time. So think of it as a time-bound release of learning that can happen over a period of days or weeks or even months. If you, you can extend that time horizon out as long as you like. So you've got the power of, um, of a social cohort uh, learning together. Um, there's a focus on, a uh, relentless focus on applications. So it's not just content push. I mean, of course, there's all kinds of ways to consume content, videos, podcasts, documents, and so on. But it's really that focus on <clears throat> application through missions and projects and, and work based workplace challenges, because that's that's how we learn. We learn through through practice. We learn through um, reflection. We learn through connecting with one another. So that that's what the platform does. It strings together that learning um, journey uh, for a group for a group of learners. And primarily, as, as, as you and I have talked, Christopher, it our, our, we see our our competitor or. Uh, the classroom, really. I mean, it's like classroom. what can you do in the classroom digitally, you know, online? And today, our class, our, our competitor is is, uh, is on the ropes. They're out of business right now. So uh, we're, um, we're 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 getting a lot of interest in you know what people are very open to new ideas for how to uh, how to engage and, and uh, uh, drive collaborative learning experiences digitally. Okay. So in the, in the bigger, right. If you were to put it on the, on the space of things, right. You've got your, you've got your kind of consumption platforms, I guess, at the higher end where like your LXP, things like that, the portals people are going through those types of things. Then at the granular level, you've got your maybe content objects and, and you're, you're kind of playing in between that while at the same time, bringing in, bringing in people kind of creating almost this micro experience. I think that when Tim and I were talking about it, I kind of said it almost feels a little bit like a boot camp type environment, an insulated digital boot camp where you're bringing people together to learn collaboratively through something. Um, but it's it's not an all inclusive portal, correct? Yeah, that's right. So there's the portal and the, the, you're going to have most enterprises are going to have a launching off point where learners find learning, register for learning, access learning, 
um, it, whether that's curated or assigned or what have you. And that could be the LMS. Yeah. It could be LXP, right? We, we integrate with LMSs. We integrate with degree, right? So, but those are ways to get to learning. They're not learning themselves, right? right. So when you get to Intrepid, you are entering a learning journey um, that often starts, you know, with a, on a certain date and travels through time together. We also support asynchronous experiences as well. But I think the power and the, the greatest differentiation in the experience is when you go through that learning journey together. You know, um, I, I talked with Josh Burson early on when he was creating that slide that I think is burned into all of our brains. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> ecosystem one that literally everybody could probably recite. Exactly. And he had the, the first version of it, though, he had LXP and he had us in there. And I was like, Josh, you know, we're not LXP, right? And so he created a new space he called the learning experience layer and he had the lxps the degrees and edcasts and uh, so on and it's time path gather um and then he put us in program delivery platform okay it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue but it, but it gets at the concept that you're our, our customers and partners use our platform to create their high stakes digital learning experiences courses programs whatever you want to call that but it is a it is a a, a, uh, a specific experience rather than a I'm going to weave my way through, you know, content, self-directed and yeah. resources and so on. Well, that's where to me, learning experience platform can be really confusing because technically the, I mean, you experience learning through a lot of different mediums. And so when you say this is the learning experience platform, it's like, well, am I actually doing the learning here? Am I not? Am I creating Right. It's, it's a lot of, of different things. So I'm I'm with you on that in terms of the clarification. And I think that's the part that a lot of people who are new to this space are just starting to tread into it. They're yeah. they're trying to figure out well what's the difference? How do I actually how do I actually work with this? So my my next question on this though is so obviously COVID, right? You talk about your your big competitor right now is probably the classroom, you know, the, the virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. But Intrepid didn't come out when COVID came out. Right. So it's, it's been around for a bit. So when you were looking at this, how did, how did Intrepid come to be? Where did you say like, you know what, this is what I'm seeing. It's a gap. It's a problem. We can do better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we had kind of an interesting uh, story. We, we were, we actually had a, a large services business, learning services business that provided consulting project work and even kind of selective outsourcing and, and uh, under the same name under intrepid learning solutions and okay. and so we had this be in our bonnet we thought god there must be a better way to do digital learning that is experiential that's applied that's collaborative and we have these you know we have facebook we have linkedin we have all these tools and why isn't anything why isn't anything in corporate learning looking like that or feeling like that or 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 um, you know can, can kind of drive that consumerization type of feel, and so my colleague Sanjay, who's on who's on the stream right now, uh, he and I thought well, also likes dogs, by the way. Oh yeah, so Sanjay, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I'm gonna have to get some tips, get get a refresh. <laughs> <from Sanjay. laughs> um, and, and so we got this idea. We're like, well, you know, what if we what if these things called the MOOCs could actually solve business problems? Okay, and they had like better finish rates than like you know, 5%, you know, like there's yeah. a lot there, right? But this this idea captured us of like learning at scale, add collaboration in, because they're, in, if not to get all geeky here, but like in the MOOC world, the, the what we think popularly of the um, the scale MOOC, just putting a, putting a video out and having lots of people take it, that's called an X MOOC. But there was another uh, derivative of MOOC called a, or a, a original MOOC called a C MOOC, which was a community MOOC, which is okay. really a way to just put a topic out and let people connect. So we were thinking like, if we get X plus C together, scale plus community and drive a, a learning experience like that, that could be powerful. So that that was the idea. And we literally started off with like a couple of slides and went and talked to some of our services customers. Like, what do you think of this value proposition? And they're like, yeah, that sounds cool. So we started building. That's how we started. Okay. Very cool. And so in, in that sense, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the use cases where people are, are digging into this. Um, you know, and, and I, go, I think I go back to the fact before we came on, we were talking about the fact that it's not when, when things went south at the beginning of this year, there was kind of this urgent need to say, Hey, we, we, we delivered a lot of things in the classroom. Now we can't, because like you said, COVID was, 
was yeah. the silver bullet, if you will, for the classrooms. Like, well, it ain't happening anymore. And so there was this demand to say, well, we need to deliver it virtually. And in in the firefighting mode, a lot of times what had to be done was, well, let's let's package up our stuff, let's let's zip it over into Zoom or or you know WebEx or whatever platform, and let's deliver it the same way. Which, from a user experience standpoint, I would say is painful right can be can be very painful so yeah. how now are people using this now that we're kind of moving back into this strategic world how are they rethinking the virtual classroom and how is intrepid helping with that then yeah i mean so so we had there was a great piece that came out in educause uh in in march and they 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 these were academic learning technologists and they were really concerned that people, students in this case, would have a bad experience with um, online learning or- a huge learning. concern about that. Huge concern because they knew what was happening. Like you've got, you're shoveling lectures into a platform <laughs> and you've got faculty who've never done this before yep. um, driving this. And they're like, whoa, red, you know, red light, red light, <laughs> caution. Um, and so they put out a piece and it, basically the piece just said, there's the difference between emergency response teaching which we understand there's a global yep. pandemic going on here and thoughtfully intentionally designed online learning full stop that's it and so that that's the message that you know we're talking about as well it's the same thing in training i mean we get it when you know the world shuts down you got to push your stuff into a virtual classroom i saw painful kind of questions going in various forums like hey i've got this three-day leadership program i'm thinking of i'm i'm thinking of like how long should the breaks be during the day when I run my eight hour session? I'm like, Oh, Oh, oh I know. I know. <laughs> right. So again, like let's have some grace. We understand an, an emerging situ situation, emergency situation. You got to do so you get just move on. But now that we're kind of pulling out of that, we have the space to say, okay, how do I do this differently? How do I, what's the highest best use of a synchronous moment? As you said, Christopher, it's not lecturing. We no. don't need to dial in at the same time for a lecture. That can be captured on video, on a podcast, on a document, various ways. And then you use the synchronous moments for coaching, for Q&A, for discussion. And you, you drive a continuous learning experience through space learning that we know through, through research is, is a superior way to learn. And, and people, people um, retain at, at yeah. a much greater rate. And then we apply. So you drive. So we're thinking of it as, as a digital blend concept. Okay. Not virtual shouldn't have a place or live learning should have a place. It's that you think about it surgically. Where is the best use of it? It's not delivering lectures. No. Well, and this is where sometimes I do feel like people, it's easy to get a little defensive because this challenges your identity. If you've been a facilitator, if you've been delivering courses, uh, you get attached to your content, right? You get attached to your content, you get attached to some of these things. And as a result, right, you can, you can get a little territorial when the thought of, Oh, we need to we need to move this into a digital format can feel a little bit like, well, what's my role in this anymore? Are you saying what I was doing wasn't adding value? And my take on that is that absolutely not. In fact, we should be using the skills that you have, which is the ability to, like you talked about, connect, answer questions, drive conversation, right? Bring people in, focus your energy on that, yeah. not standing in front of a PowerPoint delivering messages because quite frankly, it's the worst. I mean, people can sometimes get frustrated when I say this, but it's it's the worst mechanism for delivering information, right? Because you it's it's a one directional, everybody has to be at the same pace, which we all know people consume information differently. They take longer, they have different paces. It's not the best way to do it. So it's not saying what you did was bad. It's like, well, do it better and invest your energy on some of these other things. Yeah. And for and what I would say to those facilitators um, and, and experts is like, it helps you scale. Like right. it, you can, you can now um, accomplish the, you know, the, your share your expertise in those synchronous moments, but also the, 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 um, the asynchronous experience or semi-synchronous experience where you can moderate, you, know, yeah. you can moderate forums. Um, you can, you can do listening at scale, pulling insights out from discussion forums, from assignments that you see come in. And then, and then provide the highest value um, uh, feedback. Things like, hey, here are the right. trends that I'm seeing across. Um, here's some additional resources that I recommend because of what I'm seeing here. Um, because of what I'm seeing, I'm going to tee up this next conversation. And you could be then doing that across multiple cohorts, right? Yep. 
but you can't do that if you're just you in can't. delivering content all the time. Exactly. Right. right. It's about focusing on the higher order right. activities versus just the pure raw delivery of content. Yeah. Well, and, and going back to the point that you talked about with this kind of deconstructing, what is the classroom, um, things like that. That, that's a big part of it. And just as an example of, I think there's opportunity for us to do this in learning. I think there's opportunity for us to do this right now with COVID going on and the need to do this from a business standpoint. Uh, just as an example, a week, week and a half ago, something like that, my best friend was going to get married and we had to switch it. And so we actually had to deconstruct what about weddings, right? Mm are the parts that are important live? What are the parts people like? What do they not like? And actually break it down to its fundamental thing so that then we could say, how do we do this in the digital world yeah. and make the most of it? And I think sometimes where I see this go south is we get locked in the box of, okay, so we did this in the classroom. We ran this one activity in the classroom or we delivered content this way, or it was eight hours long. So now we're moving it digital. How do we make eight hours engaging? And that's the wrong question to be asking. That's right. That's right. And you know, I've heard I had a, 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 a old partner who asked like, who was her, her, she was moving to digital. And the question, the relentless question was, what are we giving up? What are we giving up from the classroom? And then she said, well, let's flip the question. Actually, what did we give up for years by having the classroom? Well, let's see, we forced people to come together at a certain time. So we eliminated any idea of spaced space learning, right? Yep. Um, when it comes to human skills, um, you know, turning to your neighbor and having a difficult conversation, that's a complete, that's just completely made up and fictitious, right? Like you're, you're play, you're role playing. Sure. Okay. But what if you took skills that you learned into the real workplace and actually applied the real skill, you know, right. and then got back and reflected on that? What did that mean for me? Um, connect with your peers um, and, and to share on that. So, you know, we, we kind of need to flip our thinking a little bit too. And, I, and I'm not saying like that there aren't things that are, you know, really powerful about being face-to-face -face and together and learning together. I'm, that's not my point. No. Because a lot of our customers use our platform, um, you know. In, a, in, in a conjunction. Way, you know, yeah, in conjunction, exactly. But it's just like, let's let's just kind of Maybe uh, maybe think about our, our our biases a bit um, and, and and reflect on those. Yeah, well, and one of the things that Alex brought up, you know, and and I agree, you made the comment right. Listening at scale, especially like with everything going on right now, I think the ability to, for us to invest our time and energy in bringing people together and listening, right, that allows us to adapt and actually personalize something that before was very, very, very difficult to personalize because our attention was split on so many different things that the, the t our time wasn't there to be able to actually listen and hear where people were and what their experience was. Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, people are coming with their own experiences, their backgrounds. They have they aren't empty boxes, right, that, that we just need to fill with, with things. They, they have their own perspective. Yeah, you know, I, I actually you know, did a, uh, a LinkedIn post kind of leading up to this, this session this week. And I, I was reflecting on, you know, what we're all going through right now as, as a country and, and, and a nation in, in the, um, in the aftermath of, uh, of, of George, George Floyd's death and, um, you know, the, 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 the protests, the concerns, um, that, that we're all feeling. And I thought, you know, how, how does that relate to this conversation? And I thought, you know, it does because, um, when we think about what we need to be doing with each other right now in this country, it's listening. And um, if we if we have a learning experience, well, too many of our digital learning experiences are about talking. They're about pushing content out. And so it can't be a one way conversation. It needs to be first about listening. It needs to be about reflecting. It needs to be about planning, taking an action. It needs to be about applying, you know, and, and practicing new behaviors, skills. Yes. But in this moment, behaviors are what matters. And so that that is really what we do. I mean, that is what the workflows, the, the tools, the experience of, of in, Intrepid um, does. And so I think it's it's, it's incredibly relevant. And um, we, we have a history of a lot of success working on developing human behaviors, skills, facilitation skills, um, uh, listening, communication. That, that's a very popular use of the platform, a lot of times organizations come into that being like, that can't be done. 
That can't be done. <laughs> I've heard it. No way. Right. Can't be we can't do this can't do this. outside can't. the classroom. You're like, yes, you can. <laughs> and they're people through it, and they're like, wow, I think that was actually better. <laughs> yeah. You and know, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Right? Well, I actually had, um, and I've been challenged with that in the past too, right? This is a topic or this is a program we run or X, Y, Z reason, right? This is the reason. And it, there's just no way that you can do this virtually. And, um, you know, yeah, if, if literally all you're trying to do is take the thing and move it from one box to the other, I would 100% agree with that. But uh, one exercise that I've done in the past is said like again you got to lead the horse to water because sometimes if you come in and just go no we're going to do that then then defenses go up everybody's panicking but taking the time to say all right well let's let's map it out both ways right let's talk about how we would do this in a in a live synchronous right traditional method and then let's let's just also just for fun let's map how this could work in this other in this other environment where we we remove all the barriers, we remove the role, rules and things like that. And let's see where we come with. And almost universally to what you just said, by the time we get to the end, people end up looking at it and going, wait, that one's better, right? That was actually a better, we should actually do that. And you're like, well, yeah, right. That's because we all know that that actually works, um, works better. So I, I love that, you know, this actually empower. Now the one question, follow up question to this, because you're talking about some of this, there is still content. And I think that's one thing that, um, you know, people can kind of forget that it's like saying that you're doing this isn't just about eliminating content and saying, no, there's no content. It's yeah. about using the live time to not go through content, use the live time to solve problems, discuss, listen to one another, share with each other. Yeah. Is there is the content something you have to bring in? Is there content creation capability within the tool? How does that work? Yeah, so so it's it's there, there's there are there's content that's created outside the platform, so okay. you can you know build, like shoot a video and upload that, or or a, an audio file, or a short e learning uh, package, or or a, or a document. Uh, but then there are ways there there are content items that can be authored in the platform. So okay. So simple context tiles or, or uh, um, assessments, or uh, probably the most powerful are uh, the assignments, the, the, the mission, um, the, the project. I mean, I, I, let me know, like I can pull something up too and show sometimes the pictures work a thousand words um, uh, with that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Well, and we'll, we'll dig into that one question that came up that uh, I can't see who it is, but um, they asked about the comment you made in terms of helping promoting, like, how is, how do you see some of these, you know, capabilities being able to embrace and broaden diversity in the workplace? Yeah. So from a content perspective, we have multiple partners right now who have built uh, programs on Intrepid focused specifically on unconscious bias and diversity and inclusion. So, uh, for example, uh, Deloitte uh, has a whole series of programs they've built with our platform. Uh, the, the, the brand that they've gone to market with is called Adept Pro. Okay. So basically, it takes the expertise from their practice areas. And Deloitte, not surprisingly, has a, has a, a phenomenal practice in diversity and inclusion. And so they have a, a program on unconscious bias that the whole, I believe the whole firm has taken at Deloitte. And then they've rolled that out with different, uh, different clients as well. Um, we have... Other, other partners like um, uh, Talent Dimensions that has uh, created uh, programs on, on diversity diversity and inclusion. So from a content perspective, um, that, that is certainly being done. Um, from an experience perspective, I think that's where the power comes in um, beyond just delivering content, especially yeah. on a topic like diversity and inclusion, because um, it is about fundamentally about self-reflection um, about sharing and connecting with others, um, sharing those experiences, sharing your experiences, listening to other experiences, um, working together in, in a small team, you know, for example, like I'm reading and, and talking a lot in real time as we all are right now about um, uh, s small groups in, in the workplace uh, being organized to have uh, uh, authentic uh, conversations, authentic and vulnerable conversations with one another. So th those possibilities um, can happen um, yeah. as well. Well, and what's interesting about that is, and where I see the 
just from a pragmatic standpoint where I think this can, you know, whether we're talking about diversity, whether we're talking about all sorts of different topics, when you look practically what happens a lot of times in kind of the traditional model, you, you have an agenda of things you need to get through, right? You've got your, you've got your content list of things you want to get through and inevitably conversation, things happen, there's distractions. So your time starts getting pinched. And to me, that's where it goes south because then what do you trim back on? What are the things that you miss out? Yeah. You, you shorten these important things of talking, having authentic conversations, actually digging into the problems because, well, we've got to get to, we've got to make sure we get through X, Y, Z. And so you're actually stripping the real value of that live time out in order to actually be able to get through it. So I think getting to that point, that's where you're taking the best of both worlds and, yeah. and bringing them together. You know, and, and it also connects back to that quite that comment about list, listing at scale uh, that I made too, and someone commented on. And um, you know, there's some really interesting ways to approach that. So if if you if you imagine, uh, let's imagine a a six week program that you've rolled out, and you've got your content outline for that, and you've you've built you could you, you could even imagine building like the content for week one and two, and you just got the outline for the future weeks, and you could. That could be intentional. You're not just like uh, waiting to the last minute to finish your course, but yeah. you could launch the program with week one and use listening at scale to inform the design of the future weeks intentionally, right? Because you have certain questions, you have certain experiences you want to listen to the cohort and the organ and, and yeah. the group that's going to the learners in order to inform, um, you know, where you take the experience. So it's, that's that power of the flexibility and the listening and making it not just X scale, but C community. Yeah. Um, really taking seriously both of those aspects. Yeah. And well, Stacy brought up a good point. And I think this is one that goes back to what you talked about. And again, you it's not the technology necessarily unlocks this, technology enables it, which is instead of the DNI concepts having to be their own standalone course it's more hey you know what we can in incorporate that into a course on leadership skills or a course on how to be a more empathetically basically anything we do because now the discussion can be very authentic with the group of what does this actually mean to you how are you applying that what challenges are you facing because the reality is based on backgrounds based on organizations those challenges will change. And so this is an actual opportunity to bring that to light by instead of, I think Gary said it earlier, right? Instead of us having to be the knowledge spewers, right? It's more, let's learn from each other. Let's learn together. So I think it's a, it's an important piece. Um, yeah. So on that one, you know, what kind of, I guess, just from a time standpoint, because I'm curious, as you work with organizations, it's easy let's say somebody comes and says, Hey, we've got, we've got this program. We want to move into the, the virtual world, the digital world. I think some people, this may be new territory for them. Not mm -hmm. maybe it is new territory for them. Yep. And that natural tendency is to say, well, this is what we did before. Let's just think about, right. We'll take these slides and we'll chunk it into this module and these slides, mm -hmm. this module, right. And it all comes together. How do you help with that kind of mindset shift? Is that something that as you work with a client, you're actually helping them through that transition? Because obviously you've done it a lot. Uh, yeah. And so for a lot of people, this is new territory. Yeah, yeah. And this is, I think this is where our heritage uh, coming out of a services background um, okay. helps us. Um, and, and by the way, just to finish that part of the story, like we, we, we end up so believing in our, what we were doing with collaborative learning technology that we sold that services business to Xerox and yeah. became an independent company. And then eventually we were, Intrepid was acquired by Vital Source about two, uh, almost three years ago. So um, at any rate, we have this services DNA as, as in value as part of our team. And, and we see a, the, the, a big part of our client success is um, working with them to create program one. Like let's, let's get, go, you know, side by side, roll up our sleeves, and work together to create this first program. And we call our team the learning experience design team. They take an, an agile um, approach. 
So it's like all the waterfall, um, you know, kind of approaches to instructional design, alpha, beta, you know, <laughs> you know all that all stuff. Cool like, words that do we use? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like nine months later, you might have a module, you know, that's, that's, out, <laughs> that's out the door. Right. So, so we just kind of jump in and, and, and we start, we start uh, uh, scaffolding, we build, we build the experience in the platform. It's not like you do okay. some kind of outside the platform and then convert it into the platform. It's like all being done in real time. Okay. Um, and we're introducing, you know, our, 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 our uh, customers and partners to our, to our tools um, in, uh, in real time. So we love it when they come with some content, that's great with an outline. Um, but you can, you can kind of create that scaffolding and then fill in where your gaps are easily. Once you've got the narrative arc of the learning, ex learning experience built. Okay. So it's not to, to clarify then intrepid isn't necessarily just a, right. You buy this thing off the shelf and then you're left to it's, it's kind of an experience as part of this as am I, am I understanding that right? It's like, yeah, yeah. you're buying the technology. And as part of that, we're, we're helping you through, you know, actually bringing that technology to life. Yeah, that's right. We're, I mean, our goal is to teach, teach our clients to fish uh, right now in response to COVID um, we have, uh, we, we're, we're not charging our, our new clients, um, for that service and we're doing it virtually. Um, okay. so that, that's a, that's a real value because we just, you know, we want to make it easy for people, um, because everybody's trying to switch to digital right now and we think we've got something valuable to add. So we want to make it easy for people. Okay. And I think it's an important thing that to do this well, I think sometimes we get so caught up in the, let's just get it done, right? Let's just yeah. move things digital. And yeah. The risk we run, and I and I've said this a couple times before, is I feel like in L and D right now we're we're a little bit positioned to take a moonshot, right? All eyes are on us in many regards. Totally. A lot of people are leaning on us, going, "What are you going to do?" And we have a unique opportunity to land on the moon and yep. and you know be a hero. If we're not careful, we could sh shoot right past it and fly into the sun and and completely destroy things. Now that's pretty post-apocalyptic, but I think it's one of those things where it's important that yes, there are things we need to move fast on and just kind of put out those fires, but at the same time, be thoughtful and strategic yeah. about, yeah. we don't want to have an environment where when things are done, people go, see, digital learning really doesn't work because yeah. it, it was a terrible experience. Like, well, that wasn't really digital learning's fault. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 yeah, exactly. It's like, let's not confuse emergency response training with intentionally designed online learning. And I couldn't agree more with you, Christopher. Like this may be the best time to innovate in learning in our career yes. right now. And I mean, the conditions um, as mind blowing as they are, as challenging as they are right now, people want change and they're yep. open to change. And um, I think there's a, there's a sense of grace, um, to some extent as well about from the learner saying like, yeah, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to try new things. I, I'm, we're, we're not hearing like, oh, that's the way we've always done things. You know, that, that's, that's out the door. So, so <laughs> now, in many cases, it literally is out the door. You, you exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so now's the moment. And, um, you know, there's this quick, I'll just tell you this, this quick anecdote, which I heard as a quick story, which reflects this to me. Like I was talking to a friend of mine who, who's written a book on um, the subscription economy. Okay. And she was saying like, Sam, let me tell you about my mom. So my mom's like in her seventies and she's not a digital native. Right. Um, and she, you know, she would love, she'd love to like meet her friends for coffee. She loved to go shopping at the store every week. She loved to go to the yoga studio. And she said, okay, then COVID hits, right? Guess what? Instacart for shopping, yep. uh, Zoom meetings for, co for, for coffee hour, and then, you know, some kind of platform, Zoom, Zoom or whatever to do online yoga. And she's loving it. You know, yep. she's loving it. And the question is, she loves it so much. What will she go back to? <laughs> what will she go back to? She, you know, maybe she'll go back to some things and the whole future will be different. But that, that's a parallel. We need to think about like, yeah our world has just been completely turned upside down. We're not going back to the, I mean, this whole, like we're going back to normal. Uh, -uh. <laughs> I actually don't think we should. I think it no. would actually be a disservice if we did. Um, so on that, and a, a question came up, I want to talk a little bit about, and then somebody actually said, I'd love to actually see intrepid, which we talked about doing that. So let's get ready yeah. to actually yeah. show a little bit of what that sure. does. Um, but one of the questions that came up was right. 
and this this does come up a lot where I see this like, well, but there are things in person is important versus you can't do everything digitally. I think the answer to that is it's it's less of a, hey, which one is better? Yeah. It's yeah. about reaching people where they are. And I think that's what's exciting about technology. And, and just as a little story, there was there was one organization I was in. We had a really phenomenal onboarding program. Um, and it was in person. And I remember proposing that we we needed to transform it digitally. And people freaked out because they thought it's working so well. Why would we do this? And I said, well, but it's working so well for the 60% of people who can be in person, but yeah. there are 40% who can't. It's not that they don't want to. It's not that it doesn't work. That 40% gets nothing. Yeah. So how do we actually augment things to say, it really shouldn't matter if people are in person or not. It should be a seamless experience. And I think that's where, as you think about these things, it's less about saying, you know, well, aren't there things we have to do in person? Sure. If it works, do it in person. But but also think about how do you include somebody who maybe can't, whether it's I mean, there could be a million reasons why they can't. And I think that's the part where it's like, let's not choose sides. Let's yeah. just say, how do we make an extraordinary experience for people no matter where they are? And I think that's where, you know, the, the technology can help us do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's like, and, and that's what, you know, the, the lessons we've seen here with, um, with, with MOOCs and other programs at scale, it's like, um, you know, the, the, the reach and the, the people that it's now including is, is, is phenomenal. It's yep. absolutely phenomenal. And the data coming out with, you know, the, the number of learners hitting Coursera and Duolingo are just mind blowing. Yep. Um, but, but I do think too, that those are delivering content at the end yes. of the day. And I think, um, I, I hope Shraddha, I'm, pr I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I apologize if I'm not, but I, I, I think you ask a really good question and this is not an either or if this is this what you're getting out here Shrada, is is the idea of the blend the, yep. whether in the in the old world pre covid that would be blend around a, a classroom experience in the new world it can be blending around um, synchronous yeah. experiences so absolutely it's um it's not just it's not just async. Um, it's not just semi-synchronous. When I say semi-synchronous, by the way, sometimes you're like, what are you, is he talking <laughs> you're about? You're making up a new <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So se se semi-synchronous, all, all it means is, is it's a digital experience that's time bound. You've got to start you know, yep. week one, week 10, and you're traveling through that experience together on the rough same schedule, but not, not within a particular week. Doesn't mean Shrada and Susan and Bob and I are all in at the same exact time. Like we're working on our work at a time. We're in a discussion yep. post at different times, but we're on the same schedule. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that's just it, right? We don't, technology is allowing us not to have to choose. We can say yes and to everything. Bob, I, I see you're on here. So you'll appreciate the yes and plug um, because it is, it's yes. And you know what, if people are in person, great, let them collaborate in person and they can do their portion for the people who aren't great. They, they can collaborate digitally and we just need to think about them both collectively and then pull them together in a seamless experience, which I think is, is where we want to go. So let's pull it up. Yeah. If you want to pull it sure. up, um, yeah. you know, so that Susan does knows that we saw her and heard her, um, let's take a look at what one of these experiences actually looks like. And I'm sure that's going to bring up some questions for people who are watching. I know, I know it will for me as well. Um, so that we can actually see, hey, all right, you're taking this program, you're taking this experience, this boot camp, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then let me bring this in here. So let's pull this into the stream. Talk to me about what we're what we're what are we looking at here? Are you seeing my screen? Okay, I first am, of all? and everybody okay. else is. Yes. Okay, cool. So I, I'm going to share a really simple one and and, and go through some concepts. Um, we could we could do I could tell another one with uh, Microsoft. It's got a great business. Uh, outcome story but this this one this one is really accessible uh, as you know as, as a good example to start with so this is a course we just finished um, this was called uh, design for collaboration using the collaborative platform a little, a little meta there I, I acknowledge <laughs> <laughs> um, but this this was kind of our idea to you know get, give back to the, the workplace learning community practice what we preach um, honestly our our experience our um, learning experience design um, facilitator face of the course, you know, went through it. He's like, Hey, I've got some feedback for our, our product team on <laughs> things we can improve. So, you know, like we, we want to, you know, we want to 
uh, we, we want to understand you know, how we can improve too. So anyway, the, the, the purpose of this course is to introduce instructional designers, learning leaders, uh, business leaders, what collaborative learning is, um, what, what is necessary, what well, you have to unlearn in order to be successful. Uh, we talk about the ages model uh, for, uh, of um, uh, an approach to learning design, and it all leads up to a project um, where um, you uh, imagine, you know, a, a new program that you can design digitally. Okay. I mean, design uh, collaboratively. So, so it's designed, and, and I guess I'll ask this question on, mm -hmm. so that's the topic of this course, yes. but it's, and, and I, you say you get out of the technology lockbox. I like that. Um, I say kind of the Stockholm syndrome of L and D that we have, right. Where we were kind of, so this is designed to help you get out of your box and say, look, instead of asking, how do we iterate on what we're already doing? Let's ask, how would, what would we do if we could do anything? Let's, let's not yeah. kind of put ourselves in a box. That's right. That's right. And, and, and the point wasn't to say, you know, Hey, all roads lead to intrepid. You know, we, we would love to help people if they do, but you know, if you have teams, if you have zoom, if you have, you know, Slack, there's all kinds of things you can do. So, um, so just, I'll give you a little bit of, of the, uh, of the experience here. So it's a three, this was a really like a mini course as we okay. a mini course, three weeks long. Um, and so as, as you enter the course in week one, you actually wouldn't see week two, week three content um, available to you. Okay. Um, we're not. So it's generally... unlocking. It's unlocking based on this. Going back to the semi-synchronous, yeah. which, That's right. um, by the way, Susan really liked the semi-synchronous, right? It feels more inclusive, less alienating. So it's yeah. it's less of this kind of, okay, you're seeing the whole thing at once. It's more as you're moving through, this stuff is is coming to light. That's right. That's right. And um yeah, exactly. So, so we had a you know three week. You kind of get the the context of of what the, what you're in for. You know, we're talking about here a very minimal commitment, about an hour of time per week. And and this is an important point too. Um, that's that we've learned over time is there. There's this idea of like seat time in e learning. Like, what's the learner time of content you're delivering? And we just completely reject that idea. Like, how long about, are we gonna pry their eyes open? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, how long will this video last? You know, it's yeah. like, that's learning, right? No, it's not. Like you actually want to reduce that time and and increase the amount of time that you're focused on reflection, application, and collaboration. So discussion forums, uh, the missions, and so on. Um, we use gamification um, it, for a purpose here to really track your progress. So you're getting okay. points as you, yes, as you consume content. But more importantly, I love the, what uh, what Jr. my colleague did here gave way more points for participating in the discussion forum and for for producing your your field reports with your activities. So that that's right. That's the way the mix should be. And then you unlock little badges um, along along the way. So you kind of okay. So you have a little it. fun with it. Yeah, have a little fun with it. Yeah. And then, you know, you introduce yourself. So we use a, we use the mission concept to introduce yourself. And, um, and so you can, you, you, all these folks have kind of gone in and said, Hey, this is who I am. Um, so that's all gonna... built right in it. So it's kind of almost, it's in the tool itself. That's right. So this is, this is the, and I'll, I'll show another example of a, of a mission a little later on. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a little wizard that you can use to say, hey, you know, what, where are you from? What, uh, what are your objectives for this course? Uh, you know, what's your favorite color? Uh, what, what, um, what, the chore, what chore do you like? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Icebreaker into the digital age. That's right. That's right. Exactly. And then we get into, to the content, you know, um, and, and this is where I mentioned earlier, you can upload files from outside. You can upload documents. Um, you can't, there's a polling feature, you know, in, in our, uh, in our platform. So I can open that poll and, you know, how are people learning at work today? Um, you know, I would say they're learning from their peers on the job. And then you see what your peers have, are, are showing there. So there's so some interactive features. Oh, let me, let me go back to that real quick, because you can also see too, that there, there are really simple user contribution aspects around this. You can like content, um, not okay. turned on here, but you could share content and 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 so on. Um, and audio file. Yeah. Going back to this this piece on some of these content chunks. So it's a hybrid. There's a bit of a blend between some can be authored in the tool, and right. then you can also bring in external things. So if you have other resources, um, I mean, is it is it are there limitations on that, or like are there specific tool? And we don't necessarily need to dig into all the nitty gritty, but sure. tell me a little sure. bit more about that. 
Yeah. Um, so we support, you know, um, many, many different uh, file types. We also support, you know, linking and iframing in um, into other sources. So if you right. have your, if you have a, um, an enterprise uh, video system, you don't have to, you know, then you, you can avoid the content management of having it sit in two different places. You can iframe that in, you can link that in. So, you know, we're, we're, we, we've designed a lot of flexibility. You can imagine with a system like ours, we have to play really well yeah. <laughs> with others, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing I was thinking yeah. as I'm watching this is that it's like, there's a lot of, it, it can't be an attempt at being a panacea because no. that's not the way things happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'll, I want just a couple of concepts here, which I think are really powerful. So um, I'm not going to play this video. I'll just open it up. But um, my colleague, um, JR, he talks about some of the things we need to unlearn. He talks about the yeah. L&D power trip, which is, of course, you know, the, the antiquated idea that L&D is the font of all knowledge and the distributor of all knowledge and the distributor of all learning and blah, blah, blah. So he kind of takes that on. And then he does a really cool thing. He does a discussion forum where he says, hey, let's get vulnerable here. And he, <laughs> titled, he tells this one, forgive me, learner, for I have sinned. <laughs> So, and he says, you know, tell us, uh, tell us about some learning you created in the past that you wish you'd done differently. And, you know, he wasn't sure what he was going to get here, but, you know, earlier in our conversation, um, I talked about uh, what um, uh, the, the idea of the moderation, right. And the power of the, of the facilitator, JR, in this case, um, to deliver that higher order thinking, right. So, here in week three, he's looking back on week two and he's done some really cool things. He says um, around the old war stories here. He said, there's so many good stories shared about uh, from the old way learning was, was created. He said, I worried that people might not be uncomfortable, would be uncomfortable sharing their stories, but they weren't. And so he reflects back on that. So he's, he's still little, facilitating. He's facilitating absolutely. through this. It's not just like this cold kind of isolated thing that people are doing. You're 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 still going back to again some of the threats I think facilitators feel in this digital space is like, well, what is my role yeah. anymore? And and what you're saying is he is playing an active role. He's still That's actively right. involved in what's going on with things and and bringing that back and facilitating learning, um, just in a different way. He's he is listening at scale. He is he is um, you know identifying the popular discussions. He is uh, he's he's listening and saying and kind of weaving the thread of the themes that he sees here. There was another one around how people uh, applied or didn't apply the ages model, getting attention, gaining insight, so on, um, to their recent projects, and and he shares the data. So it's it's really powerful um, stuff. And, and it's a really important piece. And, and I'll, I will say one thing it is that um, sometimes we get a lot of we, people nod their heads around um, wanting to do a semi-synchronous time-bound experience, but but they're, they're, every ounce of their fiber, once they get this, is like, well, can I just turn this on and like let it take care of itself? They're just so <laughs> ingrained in the asynchronous right. world. They're like, no, 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 that's not... that. that that you, you can do that other ways. That, that's not why you do this, right? You need to put in the work. You need to put in the effort to yeah. to moderate and make it bring that human element to this. Yep. Well, and one of the things that that Gordon brought up that I think is an important part, just looking at kind of the layout of this, is that allowing the learner to control their time over, you know, now especially, right? Yes. Is yes. is especially important. We're dealing with 9 million things on top of our day jobs. Yep. But I don't think that's necessarily a new thing. I mean, we already were straddling a lot of things. And to me, that was one of the biggest limitations of kind of the traditional model where it was like, well, look, you only have one opportunity to do this in this very small window of time. And if you can't, that's it. And I, th I think what, you know, Gordon's yep. getting at, and, and I would say we're both very much aligned on is being able to actually space this out, be able to allow learners to find that balance of, yes, there are certain things you can do at your own pace while at the same time, not just having it be completely asynchronous where maybe they, they don't wow. even ever get to the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, people are just, we're struggling. We've got, you know, little, I mean, Christopher, you've got little kids at home. I've got kids at home. We're balancing soon to be a puppy. We're, <laughs> Soon to be a puppy. We got puppies to balance. You know, there, there's, there's just a lot going on in our lives right now. So, so I think it's a more 
empathetic approach to let people um, give them that agency, give them that flexibility, you know, because if it's just a scheduled thing with, with synchronous, then, you know, th that may not work for someone's schedule or right. like, let's, we haven't talked about zoom fatigue yet either. Right. Like, exactly. let's, let's take, let's take, you know, let's take a step back and say, not only may there be really important instructional design reasons not to push everything onto zoom, but we've got a serious problem with it, it, as instructional designers, if we're contributing, we have to have some empathy for the number of Zoom sessions our learners are already sitting through, um, aside from the, the the barrage that we're going to put on top of them as well. So, you know, we just have to, I'm not saying that there's something, you know, we need to move away from that entirely, but we need to kind of think about the context that we're operating in as well. Yeah. Well, and it's something, um, I was talking about it recently at a, at a, conference about the fact that the empathy thing is huge for for where we are and it's a bit of an art and a science right now right because we can easily say um you know early on i think when everyone was first at home there was this attitude of well people are at home let's just have them do lots of learning and it's it was a bit tone deaf because you know what people were balancing their kids being home from school they were balancing these other things and just add to it your, your emotions and your feelings and learning are all happening in your brain and your brain only has so much capacity. So when you're dealing with a global yeah. pandemic, when you're dealing with, you know, the crisis and tragedy of, of George Floyd and all these things are weighing heavy on your shoulders, that capacity to be able to learn a new skill or develop is diminished. And we have to recognize that while at the same time, not going to the other end and saying, well, People, you know, people just are shot right now. Let's not do it. Because the reality is I've been in a lot of conversations where numbers are up, right? People are hungry for development right now because they're being challenged. They're realizing that, hey, you know what? I got a little bit too comfortable in my job or I got a little bit yeah. too comfortable that I knew everything. And now I'm realizing maybe I need to develop more. So, you know, as Gordon said, there is a lot of opportunity. I know his, his application of opportunity was a little different, but there is, there's a ton of opportunity right now if we play this well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the last thing I'll show here is just the, is the, the mission. So like I, I mentioned, like that we're relentlessly focused on application. Yeah. And so every, every week, it, everything leads up to, you know, what are you going to do with this? So this is about how do you apply the, the ages model, the instructional design model, and so it's basically, like I said, it's it's a wizard. It just takes me back to where I left off. Um, okay. But the stage here, you know, what did you make? And you go through the, the related questions and then you publish it and it publishes as a uh, as a field report. Okay. Um, and that field report is what we saw in the, in the early when people were in the beginning, when people were introducing themselves. Okay. And this is, this is a way to drive um, social learning. People can comment on it and like it and so on. So the mission then, the mission report is essentially saying, hey, this is what we did. This yeah. is what we did. Now let's actually take and apply this. But instead of doing kind of a faux scenario, it's yeah. go back because you have the beauty of space. Instead of saying, hey, you're you're here for eight hours, you have to do it. You're now saying, let's ask some thoughtful questions that make you think about how do you actually apply, put this into practice. And then if I'm understanding you correctly, it actually is generating that into something that then is then shared that others can see and actually collaborate and learn from each other on? Yeah, that's right. It's, you know, when I think there's, you hear the concept of learning in the workflow, which is ubiquitous. Yep. And, and I think oftentimes we think of that as a performance support. Like I have this thing and I need to go look it up in the workflow, right? Which is great. That's one concept. We're looking at it. We have a different kind of frame on that. It's like learning the workflow here is like learning through doing. Like yep. you are going to, you're going to actually take something back into your work from the learning experience and you're going to connect the two. So the two are no longer different. You are, you are applying in work and then reflecting and coming back and sharing and working with others. Okay. There's also a way to do this by with teams. Um, there's a way to do a, a grading rubric through project to give, to get uh, structured feedback as well from an expert or from uh, other, from your, from your colleagues. Okay. Okay. Well, I have to say, Sam, this was, it was great to take a deeper dive into it. I think the discussion alone around, right, because there is this challenge right now of like, well, it's in person, it's it's digital. It doesn't have to be either or. It's, it's about bringing the best of both worlds together. And I think this was a cool opportunity to see 
one way to do that and a, a great discussion. So hopefully uh, everybody out there, tons of comments. I think I was able to bring most of the ones, uh, the questions that came in, in and hopefully we got all those answered for you. But Sam, I really appreciate you being yeah. here. This was fun. I told this you- This was super fun. fun. Awesome. Right yeah. I told you we would run out of time. I absolutely knew we would. Um, so everybody watching, hopefully you got what you needed um, and definitely ask follow-up questions, continue the conversation, message me about joining the community where we keep talking about this stuff. Um, and thanks for being here. Enjoy getting your puppy. I think <laughs> that's going to be a very yeah. fun weekend for you. Uh, Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Have yeah. a great weekend. And Th we really appreciate all the dialogue. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, this was awesome. great. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thank Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.